working drummer. Now kick it. This is the Working Drummer Podcast, serving up perspectives, experiences, and stories from ground-level working pros. Advice, tips, and secrets on how to build a career in the music business. Hey everybody, this is Matthew Krause, and you are listening to the podcast, Working Drummer. Today my guest is drummer Wes Little. After earning his master's degree from the Manhattan School of Music, Wes remained in New York and worked with a variety of groups, including hip-hop legend Chuck D., In 2004, he moved to Nashville and continued to build upon his resume with his work touring with artists like Robin Ford and Joe Nichols. In 2009, Wes performed at Obama's inaugural ball, backing up legendary talent like Stevie Wonder, Sting, Mary J. Blige, and Beyonce. Including the decade in New York and in recent years in Nashville, Wes has been earning his place among elite session drummers in the studio scene. To find out more about this podcast, go to workingdrummer.net. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can find us on iTunes where you can subscribe. While you're there, uh, spend some time rating the podcast, and comments are always welcome. This episode is sponsored by Sakai Drums. You know the Sakai sound, now get to know the Sakai name. Trusted around the world for almost 100 years, Sakai's devotion to craftsmanship and passion in creating the world's best quality drums is unmatched. Handcrafted in Osaka, Japan, Sakai offers the most versatile drums from the Trilogy Vintage series to the almighty Japanese Birch recording kit, each boasting a distinct sound and feel. Go to SakaiDrums.com to learn why studio legends Eddie Bayers and the Smashing Pumpkins, Jimmy Chamberlain, and Tedeschi Trucks Band J.J. Johnson and Tyler Greenwell choose Sakai. Elevate your sound with Sakai. SakaiDrums.com so here is Wes Little. First of all, the studio is incredible. Thank I know you, you say Thank it's you. still. Yeah, there's a level over there, and there's uh, you know, <laughs> some liquid nails. But yeah, I'm getting there. There's a ladder in the corner. But yeah, quickly approaching a uh, a hard open. You know, I've had a soft open. I've done a yeah. fair amount of work out of here already. Hence the mess still intact. But um, yeah. I'm I'm very happy with it. It's well, between the drums and the tools, my testosterone level is has risen <laughs> ever right. so slightly. Right. Um, it's very exciting. Yeah, man. How could you go wrong with drums and tools? What, was this a standing structure, or did you build it from scratch? It was a standing structure. Um, I had a studio. Well, this is this is my fourth studio. The first little thing I built was in Manhattan. Um in a seven by 10 bedroom and it was a little practice room because I got tired of going up to the Manhattan school of music and dragging my drums out to practice Mm -hmm. and then having to sort of wrap a cable around them to keep them from getting stolen. If I left them in there or else have to take them back down to the third floor from the sixth floor to put them in a locker. Yeah. So it just was a big ordeal. I wanted to be able to practice. So I got this idea because there was a Chinese laundry underneath us (laughs) And there was a double wall separating me from the other building. Actually, if you've seen um, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, the opening scene there when he jumps off the subway platform, he kind of jumps into my building. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, yes, I have. I'm like, He's at 125th and, and, you know, 125th and uh, yeah, broad, you know. Yeah. that's He's at that subway. So we also had the noise of the train. Mm-hmm. It was like the Blues Brothers. We used to watch TV with our headphones on. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but I found this stuff by Orlex, which is also in this studio now. Uh-huh, right. Um, at the time, it was Orlex had not gotten into it, but it was this uh, lead weighted vinyl. Yeah. So I I made this practice room out of this lead weighted vinyl, put it in my bedroom, took the door jam out and turned it around so the door would open outwards, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then. Um, Basically, I uh, I slept on top of that and practiced underneath. That was Studio One. <laughs> studio Two, I moved to Brooklyn a couple years later, and I did the same thing. I built one in North Carolina mm-hmm. and made it so it's secured with casket locks. Wow. And each of the panels were about 300 pounds. Yeah. And there were 26 of them. I designed this thing so it could be put together and assembled in a basement of an apartment building in Brooklyn, where my roommate, uh, sorry, one of my ex-roommates in college had moved into uh, this community of Bay Ridge, huh. 
which um, we were able to park our cars there. He was also a drummer. He built a little practice space in the basement, and we had this under the deal, under the table deal with the super, where we give him 150 bucks a month, and it was just sort of hush money. Yeah. And we set up these practice rooms in the basement. So it was a bit of a feat of engineering. I have to say I was quite proud of that. I'd never done a lot of construction before, but here again, I just wanted to be able to practice. Oh, I feel you. You know, and in New York, you need to be able to park your car, practice. (laughs) So I was out in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and I did so. Um, That was a 16 by 12 structure. It was Mm -hmm. a little larger than the 4 by 6 structure that I built in the Manhattan so I, uh, I did that, and that's sort of where my first recording studio began. Okay. I started doing tracks for people, and you know, I had like a Mackie mixer and some other things. Nothing big time, mm-hmm. but that's sort of what set me on the, on the path. I had no idea how any of the stuff worked. I just read the Mackie manual and yeah. started reading things. Well, that's what I was going to ask you is, uh, actually, when we were setting up, I, mm-hmm. I was wondering what your background was in engineering, if there was any formal training. Uh, you know what, man? Um, no. <laughs> and honestly, that that's okay. I, I don't mind that. Um, I did have some, when I was getting my master's degree at Manhattan School of Music, I took a recording class. Uh-huh. But at the time, they just had, um, I don't even know if they had multi-track recorders. It seems like we did most of it on MIDI with Digital Mm -hmm. Performer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was using the sampler and some of those. And then I was uh, summing them all out through this Mackie mixer. But that was the extent of the recording program. We went to a few studios in Manhattan and learned about the mixers and whatnot. But beyond that course... That was really it, that one course. Mm -hmm. Everything else was just being around it and being fascinated by it. Yeah. And my grandfather was a television repairman, so I grew up when I would hang out at his store in this little town in North Carolina, which incidentally is the home of Randy Travis. Um, I would just hang out and look at tubes and stuff. Yeah. So my mind was kind of primed for this technology. Yeah. But it's all changed so much, right. even since, you know, in the last 10 years, yes. what somebody might have learned on, completely different now. Yeah. So it's always a growing field. So I, I don't really see that. Um, Some of the being, principles, yeah, though, you can point are out the are the yeah. same. Mic placement. I mean, gosh, it's so funny. I'm explaining to my kids, like, how a microphone works. <laughs> right. You know, as they're becoming kind of curious about this gear that I'm wielding around. And uh, one of the funnest things I like to tell is that, you know, the microphone was pretty much, they nailed it the first time they made it. Yes, they did in a lot of ways. A lot of the vintage mics are just And it has not, a whole lot has changed. No, Um, you know, it's about what can capture this analog sound, not always with the most perfect resolution, but the most pleasing resolution. Well, is there something that, I know you said you read the manual, but are there other resources that you found helpful? Just talking to engineers, being in the studio a lot, and mm-hmm. seeing what they're doing. You know, I would be on a session, and I would say, oh, what kind of mic is that? Or, mm-hmm. oh, is this a new placement? Sometimes they had just forgotten to place the mic, <laughs> and they were like, oh, no. <laughs> That's but curious. Yeah. it's just that sense of curiosity. And there's no, there's no substitute for just being in the field and seeing how it's done. You know, right. I mean, it's like basic training versus being in combat, for lack well, of a better analogy. Right. And there are those that want to get involved, but maybe don't have the luxury of being in the studio. Exactly. So uh, I know there's youtube sometimes but you never know you never know what you're gonna get Mm -hmm. i mean there's some like you can always go to trusted engineers like let's say um or or producers like let's say we look at um and the name is escaping me but like anything by uh and it's right on the tip of my tongue, <laughs> and I can't put it together. Help me S- out here. Somebody that's been on you that put uh, stuff on YouTube. Well, just Chris Lord Algae. Thank you. Okay. Like, let's say you watch some videos by him, and he's talking about mic placement or whatever, mm-hmm. or uh, it, it might not even necessarily be an engineer. Like, um, 
Uh, Led Zeppelin. Why can I not think of? Oh, guitars? Jimmy Page. Jimmy Page. Thank you. Sorry, I'm having a little little moment <laughs> right. here with names. But Jimmy Page uh, claims a lot of responsibility for the miking sound and technique on the bottom thing. Really? You know, which are like Glenn Johns, which is another miking technique that's uh-huh. sort of akin to the bottom sound. So by following these guys, yeah, you're sort of getting it from the horse's mouth. Mm-hmm. You know, and. You know, it just sort of begins to make sense. Like, when I got to college, I hate to say it, I didn't know what a mouse did. You know, I just, at the time, I was like, okay, how do, how do, you know. But just by getting there and playing around with it, you start to learn. Yeah. You start to learn what threshold means on a compressor, mm-hmm. attack and release, mm-hmm. ratio. Um, and man, honestly, you just trust your ears. Yeah. You try yeah, to like, yeah. and I, I, I completely understand what you're saying. If you're not in an environment to learn home recording um, from professionals, you know, yeah. you're kind of on your own. Um, but YouTube, there are a lot of valuable resources like that out there. It's yeah. just, you know, vetting the information and making right. sure that it's coming from the right source. Well, and, and because I think the reason why I bring that up is we're kind of in this dichotomy where those opportunities in a real studio with a dedicated engineer and producer, et cetera, et cetera, those opportunities are becoming fewer and fewer as this uh, democratization of home studio is rising. So you have this new generation or new group of players, just Mm -hmm. stay focused on drummers for a minute here that are interested in, in getting into this. But, um, because that field has narrowed, there's a lot of players that are not, say, just take, for example, Nashville in the 1990s. Oh, yeah. Where there were so many people in the studio spending time, and there was work for everyone. Well, there's less work now in those studios. And so the guys that were doing the master sessions are doing the nice demo sessions, and the yes. guys that were doing the nice demo sessions are getting pushed down and pushed there's down. There's definitely down. a domino effect of work, or yeah. lack thereof. Mm-hmm. And I do think... Um, you know, it's sort of the paradox of the home studio. Was it that the studios, the budgets were going down and streaming and other sources started taking away from mm-hmm. budgets? Uh, or maybe not even streaming at the time, something like Napster or something that's just offering music for free. Right. And that hurt the budgets to the point where to go in and pay $1,700 a day for a studio. Mm-hmm is not as viable mm-hmm. economically. Um, or there could be the other school of thought that says, well, all these home studios are coming and they're, you know, they're undercutting us and we can't, um, we can't afford to lower our rates like that. Um, yeah, I think they're, they're, they're both viable mm-hmm. uh, elements of, of, of why this is happening. Yeah. But I do think in some ways, because of the internet, because of what the internet has afforded in terms of digital delivery, as well as um, just people like one of my biggest clients is from LA mm-hmm. or New York. Yeah. Or they need me to send this, or I just did this record for this guy in Iceland. So it's no longer a thing where you have to be in a certain location. Right, right. And, and I think it's just sort of as podcasting versus terrestrial radio, this is sort of the wave of the future. And as much as like I'm looking at these two doors, they came out of 16 ton studios. I love that place, mm-hmm. but it was becoming a hair salon. So mm-hmm. I bought these doors at a greatly reduced rate. Yeah. But this was before I ever even really built my studio. You know, this was happening. This was a trend. And yeah. um, I think there can still be a lot of opportunity. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But yeah, is it, is it sad? Yeah, it's sad to me. I would prefer to be able to go into Blackbird or Ocean Way or what have you mm-hmm. in town mm-hmm. and play all day and have somebody press the buttons and turn the knobs and yeah. make sure everything's cool and I just get to play drummer. Yeah. It's unfortunately not yeah. like that so much. Well, it's 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 awesome in here, man. It's, it's Well, really, thank you, man. Yeah, I, again. And and you talk about the space. I mean, with drummers in general, and I think something that gets overlooked even in professional high dollar studios is the sound of the room. Yeah. You know, this is our instrument. Yes. 
It's almost like the drums themselves are the speaker, the cone of the speaker, and the, the room is the cabinet. Yeah. So this colors the tone. It, it gives the sense of air to the drum sound. And that's something that is a, is a really great nuance that's hard to replicate at times. Yes. So that's one reason I designed this with in mind. It was an existing structure. A guy had been a mechanic here. Uh-huh. And I just sort of turned his weird garage <laughs> into this. New York is a great city. Yeah. It's beaming with energy and creativity. It's like no other place on this earth. The art, the creativity, the culture is great, but it costs a lot of money. Yeah. And if you're a struggling musician making a musician's wage, Mm -hmm. it becomes a challenge. You know, you almost have to work all the time Mm -hmm. to just be able to get by in New York as a musician. Now, if you're a stockbroker, if you're making six figures, it's a different thing. Right. But um, what eventually happened, I think, to New York is... Uh, with digital delivery, with Napster, with all these things coming into play, Mm -hmm. with the change of millennium, uh, certainly the terrorist attack Mm. really affected the musical climate in the city. Really, And New York is a city that has a lot of music, but is not a music city. Yeah. If that makes any sense. No, I understand. It yeah. it doesn't mean that you don't have the uh, the New York Philharmonic or you don't have all these opportunities it, to see music. New York is like the center of the universe in so many respects, whether it's food, culture, right. international politics. And it, it was great. I loved it, and I got to see a lot of great things, and I made a lot of great connections. But here again with the Internet, I still have those connections. I still work for these people that I was working for up there yeah. in a lot of ways, uh, certainly in the studio. But, And I've talked about this with a lot of my New York friends, um, one being Tim LaFave, yeah. who plays bass with Tedeschi Trucks. Um, and we've just talked about how the climate has changed. I, Will Lee yeah. you know, is still up there. But... Uh, Will made a lot of his money on jingles as much as the late night shows and all mm-hmm, these other great gigs mm-hmm, he was doing. Mm-hmm. But a lot of that dried up. Yeah. And studios are closing. Mm-hmm. You know, Avatar, I think, has been bought. I know Clinton Sound is closed. Mm-hmm. Another friend of mine, Studio Pilot, closed. Mm-hmm. They're just closing left and right because the real estate is too valuable. Yeah. To, it's, it's a lot like what was happening here with RCA. Mm-hmm. But luckily, this is Music City. Yeah. This is a place still where guys get together in a room somewhere today. (laughs) There are, well, different studios around town. I bet right now at this moment as we're speaking, there's probably 50 sessions happening. Yeah. With guys still making music together. Yeah. It's one of the few places in the world that's still doing that. And my skill set is such that it's a good fit for me to be in the studio. Yeah. You know, for whatever reason. Uh, I enjoy being on the road. I enjoy playing live, and I will continue to do so because yeah. I think that's also a valuable part of your uh, musical palette. You of know, course. You, you've got to have it. But at the same time, this is the one place, I believe, still in the world, where there's a viable, thriving even though it's not thriving like it was in the 90s, where yeah. guys are booked out six months, 10, sure. 12, uh, sure. 10 twos, and sixes. But it's still happening. Mm-hmm. And, and it, you know, it, the cost of living is such, although it's growing exponentially here, yeah. that you can still have a place where you can have a home studio yes. and do tracks for people. Yes. So that was a big part of my decision. Okay. I mean, I, I love the city. I had a couple of bands. One was with, uh, two actually were with Chuck D., Yes. From Public Enemy. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Sure, I... sure. Uh, and I had another pop band, a couple of pop bands. We all were trying for record deals, but when all those kind of turned, uh, when, when they went south mm-hmm. and they didn't happen, then it was like, well, why am I killing myself to stay here just to try to pay my rent? Yeah. You know, why am I paying my super 20 grand over 10 years for this practice room? Mm-hmm. And he's driving up in a Mercedes, and I'm going to myself. I'm saying to myself, I bought half of that car, man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And so did my, you know, my other buddy who lived in the building. Right, right, right. So, you know, when you, when you look at it in those terms, you're like, nah. These last eight years, Nashville's been really great to me. Yeah. And things are happening um, for me here that probably would not have happened. That said, I also got to play with a whole litany of people because of my associations with connections in New York. Uh, I got to play Obama's inauguration, which yes. we played with Sting and Stevie Wonder and, and all these people in one night. And then I also got to play Carnegie Hall on a Motown thing. And this yes. is all my association with Ray Chu from the Apollo up there, who uh, has also done American Idol. Mm-hmm. And then he, incidentally, now I think is on Dancing with the Stars. Okay. He's okay. the MD there. So there were a lot of great things about New York. Well, can we talk about, I want to talk about your uh, connection with Chuck D, mm-hmm. how that came about, what that gig was like, and what the demands on you as a drummer were? I mean, man, it was great. And I think what people need to realize um, that's helpful in the way the music business works is the importance of really who you know and the networking. I mean, I can sit here in this house all day and I can play my ass off mm-hmm. if, if, I, you know, if I'm some kind of great drummer. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm not saying I'm playing my ass off. I don't. Mm-hmm. Is that allowed on this podcast? Sure. <laughs> okay. But what I am saying is there are guys that do. They just kill it. Yeah. And no one knows who they are. Yeah. And that's what happened with uh, uh, my association with Chuck D. A friend of mine who was my roommate uh, when I lived in Manhattan, when I was mm-hmm. at Manhattan School of Music, uh, started working with a, a producer and in a private uh, a little side project he had called Hard Grooves Flying Circus. Hmm. And it was an R&B band, and I loved R&B. And this guy's name is Brian Hardgroove. Hmm. Um, he's since moved to Santa Fe, but he was uh, directly involved with Chuck. Okay. And so I did a record for his band, and we got out, and we put that out. And then it came to pass that Chuck wanted to do some stuff with this band called Confrontation Camp. Hmm. And it was a band meant to address the issues uh, that we're seeing cropping up today. Like, you know, um, address issues of racism or inequality or, you know, just the injustice that happens. And um, it was a bit of a unique position for me as... uh, you know, I'm the little sort of country boy from North Carolina, <laughs> white, obviously, yeah. and I'm the only. You know, I didn't notice until you. Just yeah, I know, said right? So. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the only white guy in the band. I mean, there was a Pakistani guitar player. Yeah. Uh, and I'm still obviously all friends with these guys. You know, yeah. we we did this record confrontation camp, and we played some things. Uh, we played some like uh, mostly political things, interestingly enough. Like mm. we'd play the shadow conventions or we would play moveon.org wow. stuff. They would have like the Hammerstein ballroom. Like uh-huh. I can remember being in the green room sitting there with uh, Michael Moore <laughs> and uh, oh, I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. Al Franken. Al Franken. Yeah. And they were just talking about new radio shows that they might be doing. And, and, and at the time, Al Franken was saying, this was before he was running for Senate, he would say, uh, I'm thinking about doing the O'Franken factor. <laughs> you know? so oh, my gosh. Just, that's, that's so awesome. it's just interesting. And interestingly enough, earlier that day, I wasn't feeling too well. I had a cold or something. So Chuck and I are across the street. And he buys me like a cup of chicken soup. And, and I'm sitting there across the street from the Hammerstein Ballroom eating chicken soup with Chuck D. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just like you can't make this stuff up. I know. Yeah. That's what I loved about New York. You know, that was the, the, those are the cool moments. But we did that, and then we had another band called the Fine Arts Militia, which, uh, you know, they, I think it was at this stage in his career, Chuck could probably be paid more to speak at a, an engagement Interesting. than yeah. to actually start up a new band. Uh-huh. And just a lot of demands on his time. So even though he loved it, and it was cool, it was good stuff. We, yeah. we even played Lightning in a Bottle, that Martin Scorsese uh, documentary. Okay. It's, we did it, uh, at the, um, 
Radio City. Okay. Music Hall. And uh, Martin Scorsese directed it, and Anton Fuqua was also involved. And we, you know, we had a, uh, we had a good night. Steve Jordan was the oh. MD. And just wow. all these blues people. You had Bonnie Raitt. You had Macy Gray. You had yeah. anybody you could think of just talking about the blues. B.B. King. Yeah. So that's still out there. And every now and again, I'll get a call like, hey, I just saw you on TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. That's so great, man. All that was awesome. But, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get a band going. Mm-hmm. Even if you're famous. Yeah. Even if you have all that clout, it's hard to get a band going. Yeah. And uh, I had a really good time with those guys. I mm-hmm. love them all. And they were all very kind to me. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just funny if we would do a gig and they would all wear like camouflage. They would look militant. And I would just look like I was going hunting. So, it was just <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it was such a weird thing. But you know, they're all super great. Just needed guys. like the red beret. Yeah, like something, the clash man. Thing to, anything, to offset it. Yeah, anything. Just not a yellow vest. Anything. Just not, that's awesome. <laughs> so, we played the DNC in two thousand and eight. Mm-hmm. In Denver. And they really liked the band. Mm-hmm. Um, so they told What Ray was the band? Was it- the band was with Ray Chu. Okay. Uh, and it was Ray Chu and the crew. So it was Ray. Um, the band that did the Motown review. The band that did the Motown review. Ray was hooked into all that stuff for whatever reason. He's an extremely smart cat. Um, you know, perfect pitch. pitch but like very common sense oriented, but extremely smart. And what, what does he play? Uh, he plays keys, but interestingly enough, he does that because he's band leading. He also went to the LaGuardia School of the Arts, fame school. Mm-hmm. And when Ray went there, Omar Hakim, oh, Kenny Washington, and Steve Jordan were all in the percussion ensemble. <laughs> and he himself was a drummer, but he was relocated to Mallet. Yeah. So that was sort of where he did his you know where okay. he, he cut his teeth in the school with those guys right so there's a lot of expectation there and i feel that thankfully i lived up i'm thinking to to his expectation sure. of what he was wanting um but what they needed for these things was somebody that could learn stuff quickly that knew a great body of tunes yeah uh, already, so if he just says like, "Let's do uh, uh, Master Blaster" by Stevie Wonder, mm-hmm. I could do it, mm-hmm. and I'm not like, "What? What's the groove?" Because yeah. they're counting in his ear live on TV. And I mean, we, they were asking that. They would not necessarily ask that, but like live, you know, it's just live TV. So if something happens, you got to be on point. You got to be able to really dance, yeah, move quickly on your feet. So um, they liked the band. They wanted us back for the inauguration. That was televised on ABC. But it, I guess what uh, about it, and it's, I've done a lot of great things since. You know, I've played on records. Yeah, yeah. Even sure. this year, I was on Steven Tyler's record. And mm-hmm. there's another record coming out that I can't really talk about, but that'll be happening. Cool. And um, I played on some stuff with Robin Ford. Yep. And that's been an amazing gig. But the thing about that inauguration was that I, in one night, had to back up this um, list of stars, yeah, all with individual demands, mm-hmm. all with preferences, mm. and all with expectations. Any examples of those like list of demands from one well, to like, another? When we were playing with Mariah Carey. Mm-hmm. Um, we were playing to a track. Mm-hmm. We with all these artists, we got like maybe one or two run throughs in the afternoon. Okay, and then we have to put on the show that night. How long before these rehearsals did you have the material? Not at all. We didn't know what we were doing until we got in the hall. Wow. Yeah. So that's the demand for the gig. Okay. That that there might be some charts written out. There might not be. Yeah. You know. So you have to rely on your ears, your memory, all types of things. Did you do anything to like anticipate? Well, see, Sting's going to be there. Maybe Honestly, listen to. they sent a couple tunes. You know what? Maybe a, maybe a couple days before they sent out a couple of tunes. So I did check them out. But the one we were doing with Sting was Brand New Day, and it had Vinny on it. And I'm like, oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I've seen, I love Vinny Colaiuta. Yeah, right. He's like 
my hero. Yeah, yeah. And it's because he's just so freaking talented. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are great things like about Zigaboo mm -hmm. and John Bonham and mm -hmm. all these great things, Philly Joe Jones and Elvin Jones and blah, blah, blah. But Vinny's just an enigma. He's a freak. He is. And, you know, I just... I, I love the guy, you know, and I've never met him, but I seem to always be in his shadow and playing with people mm -hmm. that have pl that he's played with. Yeah. So Sting was one of them. That's and telling, like, man. That's I, very yeah, telling. I got, That's I, got awesome. a, I got to live up to that. And then Robin, of course, with Jing Chi and um, some other things he did. The first uh, record he had with Talk to Your Daughter, that's all Vinny. And uh, something I was doing recently, again, it was like – Man, I gotta I gotta learn a Vinny part. <laughs> the first uh, the first Shadezy record. Yeah, there's certainly that. Yeah, I, I haven't done any of that. But oh oh, it was uh yeah, it was like a, a Faith Hill thing and Vinny. Yeah, played. Yeah, right. You know. Well, she was on that inauguration. Yes. Show as so well. that was just another list of the characters. Now she brought her own band, but I did in that night, as I remember it, play with Beyonce, Sting, Stevie Wonder, Shakira, Alicia Keys. Mary J. Blige, uh, and there were some others. Was everything to tracks? Was everything have a click? Well, like you asked about specifics, like yeah. Mariah had tracks, yep. and then we were playing Hero, yep. and there was a point at which there was like this Roland Tondo, so it's slowing down, mm -hmm. you have to follow the click, and you have to nail it. It's live TV. Yeah, yeah. So you don't get a second chance. Yeah. And I remember Ray coming up to me at one of the Stevie things, and he said... Okay, we're going to end this tune. This was right before we were playing the tune. He says, we're going to end this with the Isn't She Lovely Lick. So we're going to bump, ba ba da ba da bump, bump. Well, I played it. The horns didn't. <laughs> you know, so it just, but it still came off okay. I just remember, I just remember hearing Stevie in the, the ears going, yeah, well, yeah, I'll take it. You know, so it was like, okay. But, you know, that's just the nature of it. Yeah. You know, that, that kind of gig and... And I feel very thankful to have been able to do that. But the reason I kind of focus on that is like, you've got to deliver right away, right now, yeah. in the moment. Yeah. There's no... Well, here's rehearsal. the thing, man. A lot of us are putting together, I guess, our video reel. YouTube has its place. You put out a little 30-second thing here, a minute thing here, and you've got this body of YouTube clips it seems to me you've got this incredibly well-produced <laughs> thing that summarizes a lot of what you can do and what you can handle. And what a beautiful thing. Thank you, man. Yeah. yeah. I and mean, it sounds incredible, man. You, you sound incredible. Thank you, man. And so I'd say, please, anyone go check this out, follow these links. And yeah. If, if you know, I, I'm certainly trying to get more into self-promotion, uh, it's part of it. Yeah. Never been particularly good at it, but I'm learning. Because your uh, website sucks. My website's terrible. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. It's broken right now. Yep. And I've got to fix it. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out why it's broken. You know, and these are the things that like I don't even have a website myself. Well, you know, yeah. all I've I mean, got is the it podcast. looked really good. Yeah. But now it just gives everybody an error. So strangely enough, I'm talking with a guy who also plays in Michael McDonald's band Yeah, uh, about fixing my website, but I have to dig up the password login info and I know, figure out. I know. And, and see, but do you need that? I mean, that's the question. I mean, not, do, do people, not, or do you just need one page and say, look, here's yeah. my picture. Here's a link to some YouTube clips exactly. and here's my contact information. And Give me a shout. I think that's the way to handle it. And I, you know, I have a Facebook page. I'm going to, it's sooner or later, your MySpace page is outdated. <laughs> that was pretty bad, right? Is that still up there? I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know how to cancel that. But yeah, I, uh, it's okay. ridiculous. The whole thing is ridiculous. But I'm going to certainly get my musician page happening on Facebook as well as the page for the studio. Right, right. It just takes up a lot of time. And quite honestly, thankfully, I've just been busy working. Wingate, North Carolina, it's a small town about 45 minutes southeast of Charlotte. Okay. And there's not much there. There's a liberal college. We just got, I think, maybe their second or third stoplight. 
when I was living there, there was just a blinker light. Okay. So literally it was a little town. You go through a little sleepy town uh, on the way to Charlotte. There's a small liberal arts college there. It's a really good school, um, Wingate University, where my mother, incidentally, still teaches. Oh, cool. So, you know, my parents uh, both were teachers and certainly came, I came from an academic background. Uh, But I somehow fell in love with the drums. And when Uh they saw me playing a set of, we had a wood stove. Yeah. So we'd chop wood. But at some point, I set up logs like a drum kit. Uh, maybe when I was even a little younger, my sister and I would set up stuffed animals on the stairs and we'd be at the top of the stairs as if it were a stadium. <laughs> so <laughs> my parents got this idea, well, maybe we'll get him drums. Yeah. So they did. And I played the drums a lot in the house and light bulbs would break uh, on the bottom floors because I was upstairs. <laughs> so then they were kind enough and sweet enough to um, build an outbuilding which incidentally has become a rental property for my mother, so it was a wise investment. Uh, But it's a little cottage. Mm -hmm. And uh, I set up the drums and played there for hours after school as a kid. Um, But there wasn't a lot. Charlotte was there, but it was far enough away that, you know, you you wouldn't get there that often. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, I just... I saw Billy Cobham on a Tama catalog, Mm -hmm. and I figured he must be good because he had a lot of drums. (laughs) So I bought a couple of his records, and I knew that I liked the sound of jazz, but I didn't know what it was. How old were you when you... Uh, 9, 10, 11. Yeah. Maybe a little older when I started to like really pay attention. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it was just playing to records that my parents had, which was a hodgepodge. They had a lot of classical music, um, but we had uh, like La Freak by Chic. We had Play That Funky Music, White Boy. I guess those were my dad's records, and for some reason, they appealed to me. Yeah. Sort of the jazz R&B side. I don't know if it was a babysitter or somebody that played this music when I was a kid, but I was very much attracted to it, so... Uh, Stevie Wonder. I didn't know why. I just knew I liked it. Yeah. You know, and if if Rosanna would come on the radio, I would be like, I don't know what that is, but I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So I just continued to try to seek those things out in a very small place. But it wasn't really till I got to college that I began to understand. I would begin to understand what um, what a lot of that music was about like right. I had no idea of what bebop was or mm. Philly Joe Jones or any of those guys till I got to East Carolina University which okay. is where I started I had like gotten enough training certainly to pass auditions I didn't have a lot of mallet training yeah on the marimba or xylophone I remember driving up to, <laughs> with my mom to audition at Appalachian uh, State University in North Carolina and had a xylophone set up in the back of the van <laughs> And I was like playing this piece, trying to memorize it, you know, because it's very hard to play xylophone read, especially when you're driving in a van. I, yeah, I'd say so. But so, if you can. Hey, you, you know, can. I mean, I did okay. They they offered me a, a little taste to go there, but I decided East Carolina was right for me. Yeah. And I'm really glad that I did. They, they had a great percussion department. At the time, Mark Ford, who is now teaching at University of North Texas, is oh. the head of percussion department there. Wow. Was the head of the percussion department at ECU. So I learned a lot from him, uh, certainly with the classical instruments. I learned a lot of marimba. And mm-hmm. by the time I got out of school, uh, I was playing a lot of formalit pieces. Mm. I just didn't want to do that. So it was always a bit of a struggle. Yeah. But I will say that Mark Ford is one of the premier marimbists in the world. Mm-hmm. And certainly one of the premier premier teachers of the marimba so i learned a lot from him um and harold jones too who was Mm. a who was a a great teacher at ecu but most of my drum set training incidentally came from the jazz bass instructor carol dashiel wow and he was like uh man he was the biggest influence on me he he introduced me to all this stuff all this music i'd never heard and um, you know, he played with uh, Ray Charles. He had played with Stephanie Mills. He had played with um, Bobby Watson. 
Yeah. So he was just a great jazz player. And, and I was lucky enough to be there at that time when I could play with him and another instructor on the faculty. So I really got this training that yeah. I probably would not have gotten in any other state school in North Carolina. So you were, were you playing gigs with them as well? I was playing gigs with them by the end. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure, you know, they tolerated some of it. Um, <laughs> but I, I think they also enjoyed some of it, too. Yeah. And I went back for a sort of a jazz alumni reunion at ECU and got to play with Carol maybe two or three years ago. Yeah. And it was just a blast, man. Yeah. You know? um, but that set me on a course to move to New York. He encouraged me to do that. Okay. And uh, I did so. I, uh, I had a scholarship offer from Eastman, uh, but I turned that down because I didn't want to play more timpani. Uh, nothing against timpani. Sure. Uh, so you ended up at the Manhattan School Manhattan of Music. Manhattan School of Music. Right? Uh -huh. And then uh, I got my master's there and just stayed in New York for a few years beyond that. Yeah. Here's the funny thing, and I know this for a fact because I'm friends with uh, Steve Gadd's wife on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And it's I get updates about Steve from her. Right. He doesn't even have email, man. Oh. She handles all that stuff as far as I know. So, that would be which glorious. is a great place to be. Oh, that'd be but you know, awesome. he's Steve Gadd. He doesn't need to. I know. You know, he doesn't need to do anything else. <laughs> Just be Steve Gadd. One thing I saw when I was looking online is uh, you playing with Billy Dean. Yes. And um, do you remember when you were playing with him? I started with Billy. Um, Oh, man. Were you still living in New York when you started I was playing? still living in New York. Billy Dean was my gateway gig mm -hmm. to moving down to Nashville. And luckily, I forged a lot of friendships there. Uh, one is with my good buddy, Brent Rader, mm -hmm. who's now out with Joe Nichols. But he and I also played in... Uh, Jody Messina's band. Jody Messina's band, right. exactly. And, uh, you know, we've done sessions and the like around town. And... Uh, also was in that band with uh, on and off with Danny Rader, his yeah, buddy who uh -huh. plays guitar here in town. And is doing really well. And I think he's still out with Keith Urban. Yeah, yeah. But um, Billy, it, it was kind of nuts. Uh, I, uh, I knew the bass player in his band. Ray Barnett. Ray Barnett, exactly. Mm -hmm. And Ray uh, had played some weddings down here with me because he had worked with my wife in a band. And... I was like, uh, you know, he was like, hey, would you want to join Billy Dean's band? Because mm -hmm. he just had this little resurgence with his uh, hit, Let Them Be Little. And um, I was like, yeah, man. And at the time, it's what we call a high-class problem. But some of my friends in New York had written a show that was going to be off-Broadway. Mm -hmm. And I actually got to play the part of a drummer that couldn't speak. So I just sneezed. And I acted on stage. Yeah. And then I also played in the pit. Yeah. So it was a really unique experience. And these were my friends that had written the show, and they've written some other shows since. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, I've written a show. Wow. Uh, an entire musical that I just kind of shelved, but it was during that period. Okay. And one of these days, I might drag it back out. Saucy Jack. <laughs> the yeah. life of Jack the Ripper. <laughs> and, and you would think uh, that would be enticing. No, mine is about. Um, uh, it's called the Double Wide Daddies. Wow! And it was—it's a trailer park musical, okay. but not in the sense you would think. It, okay. It's supposed—it's supposed to be more of a classical feel than making fun of people. Uh, okay. It just—it uh, was anyway. I'm getting off topic, <laughs> but the point is, uh, at that time, these two things were were together, and I didn't know how I was going to do it. But l thankfully, Ray was cool enough to let me sub out. Uh, some gigs mm -hmm. with Billy and they were really cool and covered my travel down mm -hmm. while I was still in New York which was awesome because I guess they wanted me to do the gig and then the same thing happened with uh, the the show I was able to sub out some mm -hmm. it was a little more tricky because the drummer had to go on stage and act mm -hmm. but because it was under the musicians union and not SAG or AFTRA mm. uh, I could sub out Oh, okay. So, Interesting. But that's all when it kind of started 2005, 2006. I th the reason I bring that up is that, again, all these epiphanies come when you're laying in bed. I'm thinking, holy crap. Wes is the guy that 
I went to audition for Billy Dean. Ray and I had no. done, yes, Ray oh, and I wow. had done some work together. And oh. he said, he called me up. He goes, hey, I've got this summer that we need a drummer with right. Billy Dean, who I'm the band leader for. Would you come out? He goes, I mean, you've got the gig, but basically. Right. So they were auditioning everybody. And Brent was just starting. With, and Brent had been playing drums, incidentally. Yes, that's right. He, they wanted to move him over to keyboard. Right. So he was still stopping and starting the, the tracks, the tracks yeah. on a couple songs. So I go there, and um, I don't think I played particularly well that day, I can, oh, I can honestly say. But we break for lunch, and we come back, and Ray's passing out this... Uh, tax paperwork sure for everyone but me oh now goes, I feel terrible <laughs> he goes um, he goes hey man um, <laughs> like right. so I got a good buddy up in New York and <laughs> oh, no. um, now I feel terrible I called him a couple days ago and he said he wasn't sure if he could do this but now it turns out that uh, he is available to do it and he was my first choice and so oh. you've done a good job but we're going to go ahead and use him that was you. Oh, that no. That was you. I feel so bad It was now. like I felt... That was one of the first times that I felt like I'm in. Sure. And, and, the, the, and, so, and I've told the story several times before on the podcast. Oh, wow. Because here was my experience. I was, I was crushed. Sure, but man, I would be. And I talked to a friend of mine on the way home, and he's like, man, don't worry about it. You've got other things going. You'll be fine. Sure. So, I mean, I, I kept my cool, uh, you know, uh, finished the rehearsal. Right. Because it wasn't an audition anymore. <laughs> I know. <sighs> um, then the next year, you weren't available. The next summer. Oh, cool. Of some sort. Or maybe that was the year that you subbed out. But I ended up going on the road with Billy Dean for like three months. Oh, nice. The next year. Because Beautiful. Billy said, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, Ray. Ray said. He goes. He goes. Listen, I'll I'll call you. You know, if I, I, we're going to use this other guy, he probably mentioned your name, but I don't remember. Uh, he not. said, but <laughs> we'll call you. And I'm like, yeah, he's full of shit. There's no way. He's <laughs> right. just he's just making me feel better. Right. He did call me. Exactly. He did call me. So I was crushed, but I thought, you know what? No matter what the situation, it's gonna something will work out. Just keep your cool. Don't exactly. take it personally. Um, but. Um, Anyways, I just realized that last night. I'm like, you're the drummer from New York. Oh, now I feel so, terrible. No, but you know what? I got a call from Ray like a month ago. Oh, cool. So I hear from like maybe once a year. Sure. And we just haven't been able to connect. Right. So again, it's just, well, you just never know where it's going to come from. And man, and you don't. I mean, honestly, I same thing sort of happened to me I, after... Uh, and you're always in the shadow of Finney Caliuta. I'm there behind you. <laughs> I don't know if I would go that far. I don't know if I cast that much of a shadow. But yeah, I mean, like, I, when when I left Billy. Yeah. Uh, or I didn't leave Billy. Uh, he it was just, I don't know if he was not going to tour as much. I was going to look for another gig and try to figure things out. And I moved down here in 2008. And I I remember... I auditioned for Joe Nichols. Mm -hmm. A buddy of mine had recommended me. I thought, oh man, you know, this will be a cool gig, you know, I, you know. And I went in, and it was very close between me and another guy, but I didn't get the gig. Mm -hmm. I didn't get the gig at first, and I kind of didn't know why. I was just, I was super bummed, and I was like, man, I, I don't know. I, I really thought I had this one, mm -hmm. and um, then of course, you know. The drummer at the time uh, left the band in like six months, and they immediately called me. Yeah. And then I stayed in that band for five years. Wow. Made a lot of good friends, uh, played a lot of golf, had a lot of good times, mm -hmm. uh, and paid my mortgage. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so you, you just never know where it's going to go. I mean, and you never know what factors play in. I mean, uh, but I do think that just by being positive and, and staying after it, it, it will, things will happen. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, and yeah. I know that those are tough things to deal with, but it, it just happens. I, I, and thinking about it, I remember I was going to get to play with Aretha Franklin. Ray called me 
uh, to play with her, and it was at the dedication of a memorial, uh, Martin Luther King Memorial in Washington, mm-hmm. D.C. And we were going to, you know, I was going to get to play with Aretha and James Taylor and all these Jeez. great people. And James Taylor pulled rank and said, we got to use my drummer, which I don't know if it was Keith Carlock. I don't know if it was Steve Gadd, you mm-hmm. know. But I was just like, oh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I had called a bunch of people to sub for me that weekend because I had a joke. Oh, so it was kind of a last minute. Oh, it was decision. last minute thing. You know, it always comes up last minute. It seems mm-hmm. with that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's it's crushing, man. And you're like, Ugh. but stay after it. Who knows? Maybe yeah, you one can't of these take days. it personally. Yeah. But I hope you're not angry with me. <laughs> no, not at all. Not okay. at all, dude. Not at all. No, no way. No way. No way. <laughs> Do you find yourself playing and performing differently when you're here tracking than you are, say, live? It's a different animal entirely, man. And, you know, I just look at it. My teacher at ECU, Carol Dashiel, who was a bass player. Yeah. uh, Wasn't a drummer, but he taught the jazz. And he was like, it's all about style. You know, Mm. what's the style of music that you're playing? Yeah. You know, and what I see a lot now is like guys are playing live. And they're hitting the drums as hard as they can. And believe me, visually, it looks awesome. Yeah. But that doesn't always translate in here. Yeah. In the studio. If you're hitting that hard, you're overcompensating the drum. You're not getting the tone out of it. You're not getting letting the room speak. Mm -hmm. You can't let the mics really discern these waves Mm -hmm. in the way that would be most pleasing Mm -hmm. by hitting that hard. And... Conversely, if you're out on a big stage and it's a stadium and you got a project a vibe. I mean, Omar Hakim used to say that, like, you know, I would go to the top level of the last row and look down at my drums and see how far I was going to have to throw my vibe. Mm. And that doesn't mean you got a whale, but just yeah. you are bringing this yeah. Yeah. group of people up mm-hmm. and, you know... Some of that might be volume. Some of it just might be intensity. And then there's a thing with the jazz thing. Mm-hmm. You know, you're playing, you got to be really intense, but at a low volume. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Because that's the style of the music. Yeah. And I think knowing that and doing all these different things, like I will play a jazz gig, I will play a Latin gig, I'll play a rock gig, I'll play an R&B gig, because they're all different styles and they all work a different muscle. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think the thing is, some guys just go in and bench press all the time. Yeah. And they can bench press a ton of weight. Mm-hmm. And that's great. But that's not a full body experience. You know right, what I'm saying? Right, exactly. And and that's uh, that's sort of the way I look at it, you know? And I'm sure one style complements the other. I think it does. Yeah, I think you can learn... Uh, from every style, something that can be beneficial to you in another style. Mm -hmm. If not in the physical way you're playing the instrument, um, a mental concept of how you're approaching it. Right. And I want to talk about Robin Ford. Sure. Uh, And you've recorded records with him. I've now done, uh, well, I've done two records with him as Robin Ford. A Uh Day in Nashville was the first with Audley Freed and Barry Green playing Hmm. trombone. And uh, Ricky Peterson playing organ, which was great. And uh, Brian Allen and myself, and of course Robin. And the last record we did uh, was about two years ago in in Robin's, uh, of his records. And that was called Into the Sun. Mm. And it featured uh, Jim Cox on organ, who's great. He's an L.A. cat, plays on a lot of film scores, but he also subs for like Larry Goldings on oh, James Taylor, or he also yeah. plays with Lyle Lovett. So he's a very talented, super talented cat. Yeah, yeah. And just like a mad scientist and can play anything. And he's just, he looks like a teacher, but he grooves like a, I don't know, <laughs> like he's from the funkiest juke joint ever. You know, so... Sorry, Jim. You, you don't really look like a teacher, uh, but you that's know what okay. I'm you know Peter Erskine. Yeah, well, that is, he kind of looks like Peter Erskine. Well, because you know, because Erskine said that when he auditioned, I think Joe Zawinul heard him yeah. and said, "I like this guy." 
Then he showed up, and then he saw his passport photo. <laughs> and Joe said, I'm glad I didn't see your passport photo before I hired you because I don't want no jive-ass, jazz-educator motherfucker in my band. <laughs> oh, man. Which, you know, Joe's in many ways... Well, it that's makes what Earth's gonna. He he is, he that, is yeah. that he is that jazz. But educator. you know, Erskine's great. I mean, but that's that's the kind of thing. You know, looks can be deceiving. But yeah. Jim, Jim, and Brian and Rob, and myself. So it was a quartet, but still a great record. And, it, and a lot of different people stepped in, like Keb Mo, oh, um, I, Warren Haynes. Maybe played mm-hmm. some. I, I can't remember who all was on the record. ZZ Ward. Um, so it was cool, and we've been touring that in the last couple of years. And then I've d- I've done one record for him here, with an artist that he's producing from Iceland, and then we've done another Guitar Army record, which is with Leroy Parnell Jeez. and Joe Robinson, and we're actually going to be touring that starting this week on, okay. on September the eighth, and we'll just sort of do a, a West Coast tour with that. Is there a song that you've done either live and then brought it to the studio for the record, or? learned it in the studio, recorded it for the record, and now you're performing, because obviously you're backing up the record. Mm-hmm. Um, what I'm trying to get to is maybe um, something about um, a part that was played for the studio, and then maybe a part, maybe the way it's performed live. And I know that sure. there's different rooms and different size venues, but maybe is there an example... I know for me, there's sometimes it's like, well, I played it this way in the studio, but live, it might change a little bit here or there. Is there an example of that with Robin? Well, there definitely is, man. I mean, there is a... Um... There's more of an improv. Yeah, and the thing with Robin is he's such a consummate musician. I mean, obviously, he's a virtuoso, but in the most musical way. Um so it's different every time we play. That's cool. And we try to capture the spirit of the record, but we play to the environment. We play to each other in the environment. Um, how we speak through our instruments mm-hmm. is different from day to day on how we're feeling and where we're playing. Yeah. Um, there was one tune on the record. Uh, Nico Bolas uh, engineered that, mm-hmm. and he's like Grammy-winning engineer. And Amazing. I uh, worked with like Neil Young and all these people. He's he's out in L.A. He was in Nashville for a minute, but he came in to engineer the record. And I just remember one tune. I took like a, a broomstick kind of thing. It's the Vader version of that. I think mm-hmm. they call it the uh, whip or something. Okay. Okay. Um, and I had like a, a rod in one hand, and I had you know the kick. And Nico said that he only used one mic on that track. So, you know, the drum sound, and it's the first tune on the record, so it opens up, and it's got this vibe um, that we captured in that room. Mm -hmm. But it was a certain snare drum, it was the room sound, it was this, that, and the other, it was the one mic. And then you get live, and you you have to adjust that. And I think that's... uh, I think that can be a downfall at times. When people really try to so um, meticulously recreate something mm-hmm. in a space that's not meant to have that created mm-hmm. in it. Mm-hmm. So I think by living for the moment and playing to the environment and to each other in that environment, you really end up with a better product live. Mm-hmm. And knowing the difference and when to apply it yeah. is, is the real art of it. Yeah. The melody, the song is there. It just right. has to be approached differently. There's also the the school of thought. It's like we're going to create songs that are going to translate well live. Exactly. You know, so you do you take that approach, but then uh, there's the other approach, like whether uh, like the Beatles, where you're using right. the studio as that other instrument, sure, itself. And uh, right, but they that it didn't matter to them because they weren't touring anymore when that was more of a right. thing. And believe me, I see the virtues in both. I mean, I guess like when I was playing with Jody, she wanted everything exactly like the record. And what oh, yeah. I found out was it wasn't exactly like the record. It was exactly like the record as interpreted by the previous drummer. Yes. So I learned all those things, and they pretty much had to be for verbatim. 
and that's what she wanted. I played with her one weekend. Oh, did, two, so did you shows. run into that? Yeah, I, they they surprised me with a board tape after the first show. And oh. They went down and took notes and yeah, told me which crash symbol I hit one too many times. I know. And listen, I I understand that yeah. she's the boss. Yep. She's paying. Yep. She and I got along great, and it was probably because I understood that was the rule. That's yeah. what this gig is. It's like a Broadway gig in New York. Yes. Where you're in the pit. These dancers are doing this every night. You are going to play it like this every right. night. And she's performing based on yeah. what's behind her. Exactly. Yeah. So I get all that. But at the same time, I also know from being in the studio, from seeing how sessions go down, that what that drummer played at that particular moment yeah. might not have even been something that he liked. Yeah, it might not have been the Bible and the religion of the record mm, mm-hmm. as some people might make it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I think here in here again, mm-hmm. it's knowing when to adapt. You yeah. know, because some things can feel awkward mm-hmm. that would be better served by playing something differently, uh, but you don't because that's what was played on the record. Right, and if you have that, and if you have that option, sometimes it's good to just let it go because a lot of times whoever performed on that track, they were improvising. They were in the moment. And again, the producer or the engineer might have picked that take and he wouldn't have known. The, exactly. Yeah. And furthermore, I know as being a producer that what I'm trying to do is get the best performance out of people. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to let them do their thing mm-hmm. so they can make the music happen. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes when we get so entrenched in this is the part, this is the only part, Mm -hmm. sometimes it is. But I think sometimes it can do the music... A disservice. A disservice. Yeah, Yeah. because you never know. It could have been, something could have been better. Yeah. You uh, you probably run into this where, say, you worked on someone's record, and then they'll say... uh, Then, of course, you get the record. Sorry, the CD or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I still prefer record. Yeah, you hear hear it like a year later when it's finally done and the budget allows the sure. final product to come out and then they'll say hey we're gonna do a cd release party and we want you since you played on the record we want you to be uh at the cd release party we want you to play and since you played on the tracks i, I mean it, it should be easy for you because you right. played on the track you're exactly. like wait a minute i knew that song for like 20 minutes <laughs> exactly it's not you know they've been living with it they've been hearing it oh yeah and it can it can be a bit of a curse you know even because you're having to go back and learn what you did and sometimes i'm like I don't even like what I did. Yeah. They might love it. Yeah. But even for me, it's like, well, I, I probably would have played something differently if I'd right. you know, been in a different place that day. One of the things that you're doing is uh, a master class mm-hmm. at PAS, mm-hmm. a rhythm section yes. master class. How did that come about? And uh, is this the bass player from Robin's band? It is the bass player from Robin's band, and he's a fantastic bass player. Um, I, you know, he and I are kind of like brothers, and we, you know, bust each other's balls. And but I really love playing with him. He, to me, is one of the best bass players I've ever worked with. Mm-hmm. And certainly here in Nashville, if he's on the gig, I, I want to be there. Yeah. Um, What's his name? Brian Allen. Okay. He also taught at MI mm-hmm. and taught a bunch of people out there, including Travis Carlton, Larry Carlton's son, who's oh, wow. playing bass now. Jeez. And the thing I love about Brian is he's so versatile and musical, yet he grooves like no other. And we get a lot of compliments about us playing together. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like you guys are great separately, but together it's like this magical, unstoppable. That's awesome. Thing. Yeah. So we've decided to capitalize on that. And we actually have a video series coming out. We'll probably do it through True Fire. We might even press a DVD. I don't know. But it's going to be called Rhythm Section Masterclass. Awesome. And we go into the uh, subtleties of grooving. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody can play a million notes. They can do all these things. And that's great. But what you get hired for 95% of the time. Mm-hmm is your ability to groove and yeah. make people feel the music. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're focusing on. So we just sort of go step by step, and that's what we'll be doing at PASIC, because mm-hmm. I think that gets overlooked. You know, it's, it's such a subtle thing, and, and sometimes people aren't even aware. Mm-hmm. At, 
that that's what gets you hired. Yeah. You yeah. know, I remember Arthur Taylor was playing at Manhattan School of Music, a clinic, and he was playing a swing beat, and he was talking about, he was like, you know, this right here, this gets me hired. Right. You know, all this other stuff is great, but this yeah. gets me hired. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I think that's important. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're going to focus okay. on. You know, we'll we'll play some flashy stuff too, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to meat and potatoes groove. Yeah. The last thing I want to talk mm-hmm. to you about is uh, we touched briefly on the fact that your wife is a singer. Sure. And uh, so that's, you have that together. Exactly. And um, I know it, it, being married and being a musician is a challenge enough. Oh, yes. Having yes. two musicians can be a challenge and, and probably has its benefits as well. I agree. Um, was that? The- well, uh, it, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, it's, you know, it's. <laughs> The the plus side of it is we know the what each other's dealing with. Yes. We understand. Like if I say, honey, I'm sorry, I, I gotta stay here at the session another hour, or mm-hmm. I've gotta, you know, I gotta I don't feel like it, but I need to go out tonight to see these people and make these connections. Um she will totally get that. Mm-hmm. At the same time, you know, it's your your musician. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's feast or famine. Yeah. Sometimes um, it can be wildly unpredictable. Yeah. But I think at the same time, you begin to realize that a lot in life in the job uh, climate is unpredictable. Oh, even you know, outside of music. Yeah, exactly. I mean, guys are getting laid off there. So I think what we're trying to do and what I'm trying to do is establish a lot of different income streams. Uh, like after we finish this in- interview, I'll be teaching here. Okay. And then at some point, I will be uh, at the end of the month producing a record. Mm-hmm. And then I will have this video series. And then I yeah. will also play live. And I'll also go in the studio. Yes. So that it's just sort of a smart way to diversify. Yes. And I think that's for any musician, married to a musician, not married, mm-hmm. uh, is, is a wise way to go. Yes. You know, and I know that when you are married and you have kids, there's a lot of, it takes a lot, man. Yeah. I mean, kids, uh, we, we don't, uh, my wife unfortunately had a uh, ovarian cancer many, many years ago and had to have a hysterectomy. So, okay. uh, that's not been as much of a, a play in, in as much play. Mm-hmm. For our relationship, uh, but I know when people do, you know, you have to provide for those kids, and they are the important thing. Yeah, you know, they're they, number one. They're much more important than a gig or mm-hmm. a tour or a song. They're perhaps the, you know, the the biggest creation of your life. Well, yeah. I would say the biggest creation yeah, of, of your course. life. Yeah, uh, you know, so. But if this is what you do to earn and are living, it's a constant yeah, struggle. It, it is, and I can I can really I can only slightly sympathize with <laughs> musicians with children, but I know it's got to be tough, man. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, having supportive uh, spouse and and kids that aren't insane are are nice. <laughs> well, that's great. Uh, so I can only I speak personally. Awesome. So the, the 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 other thing, and that's I love that you bring that up, the diversification and all that mm-hmm. stuff. That's really important. The um, and what you're doing mm-hmm. to diversify. Before I kind of knew more about who you were, about a year and a half ago, you posted something on Facebook that your wife had done through Craigslist. Oh yeah, Joey. <laughs> Could you briefly describe this? Well, and I, 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 I'm wondering if there's a way that we could make that accessible for anybody. That's absolutely, I will. I will send it to you. Here's, here's the thing. Not only is it hilarious, <laughs> but. <laughs> I, your wife sounds like she's got a great sense of humor. Oh, she's yeah. very intelligent. Yeah. And I, I, that's one thing I love about my wife. Sure. Pers- myself is that she's just, she's just this sarcastic, intelligent right. uh, person that just kills me. Well, her sense of humor. And it sounds like Brit had the yeah. same thing. I mean, Brit is... Oh man! But as a drummer, yeah, it's like she, oh my gosh, she nailed it. Well, I mean, she's you know she's been in bands all her life. She's lived in band houses. Uh, you know, she's been around musicians. Uh, one of her ex boyfriends uh, was actually Van Romaine, if you know Van. 
yeah. a drummer. He plays yeah. with the, he played with like uh, the Dixie Dregs and uh, mm-hmm. uh, I think now he's out with Enrico Iglesias. But the point is that she knows drummers. You know, she knows <laughs> it. So she set me up, man. Uh, and she screws with me all the time, or used to. Not as much <laughs> lately. I think I've gotten a little less gullible. Um, but she, uh, <laughs> she, I was trying to sell this kit that I had long mm-hmm. ago, yeah. uh, a Tama kit. And she pretended to be a young drummer. And this was you posted on Craigslist. I posted on Craigslist. And she pretended to be a young drummer in search of a kit. Yeah. And she knew just enough to say the right things <laughs> and make me think it was legitimate, but yet crazy enough to make me think this kid is out of his mind. <laughs> and she was banking on the fact that I'm a nice guy <laughs> and that I will entertain this. <laughs> and then she was working the other angle. She'd be like, well, did you hear from that kid that wanted to buy the drums? I mean, you think you're going to be able to sell them? And I'd be like, no, this, this crazy kid, I don't know, man. It's just, it's all weird. He like wants to bring his band over and rehearse mm-hmm. with the drum kit. And I was like, she said, well, he's just young. Just, you know, so she would inch me back to, you. she would just sort of push me back yeah, yeah, yeah. into the dialogue with this kid. And it was... This was all through <laughs> an email correspondence. It was all through so email she correspondence could, through yeah. Craigslist. And she got me. It kept... Yeah going that was that was like the, i i remember i was out with the band and i was i was reading that to them and as soon as i got to the part about phil collins i was like they they just died they're like what what i know well, out of nowhere my wife is she's done sketch comedy she's funny she's a funny girl she's done sketch comedy and she did some in new york for this little comedy team called the netwits and she just has that thing, man. I just That's awesome. really find her funny. That's awesome. yeah. Well, I tell you, there's been a couple of things where we've had to direct some listeners to something that we're referring to, and, and this might be one of those things. So we'll have to work something out. Absolutely. Well, and, I, will, um, I it, will find the Joey thread, and I'll yeah, give it to you. Uh, and um, I'll put it, uh, maybe, a, maybe I might not put it in the show notes, but maybe I'll put a link to it. And somewhere where we could you could get to it or whatever. Absolutely. Uh, there's been a couple of things, uh, but that would be definitely worth yeah, checking out. Yeah, I think out. any drummer, good laugh. any drummer could appreciate this, especially if they understand the angle, because it's you could just see her working the whole thing, and it's just the biggest hustle ever. I mean, it's, it's great, but you know, I just oh man, it's it's classic. It's fun. Man, thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me uh, come over here. Oh, man, absolutely. Anytime. Yeah, and thanks for just talking. Thanks for having me on the show, man. I'm really thrilled to be a part of it. And, uh, man, really um, just excited that you and some other folks you're working with are doing this, you know, like to have a working drummer podcast because I think it's it's an insight into things – behind the scenes with working drummers that can help people coming up, but also just, uh, you know, give people a glimpse into a slice of life. Right. They, they don't have to make up a story. You know, they can yeah, like, yeah. you know, it's like, okay, that really happened or that's yeah, the way that yeah, worked. You yeah. Know? No, it's, it's, it's good. And, and, and just your stories and everything that you're helping to add to the dialogue is, is great. Excellent, man. Well, anytime I'll be glad to talk. Cool. All Thanks, right. Wes. Thanks, Matt. So there is Wes. I want to thank him for his time. Uh, Again, we talked about, right there at the end, that fake Craigslist ad that his wife posted. And within the show notes, uh, there's a link we're going to put. If you click on, click here, down there towards the bottom about what we talked about, you can access that thread. And uh, I encourage you to do so if you uh, need a good laugh. It was pretty awesome. Um, Props to... Wes's wife for doing that. Um, it was really funny. So check that out. My thanks as always to Mike Jackson. We uh, needed a little extra technical help this week. And as always, Mike came through and I really appreciate him for that. So we're going to check in with Zach Albetta here and uh, see who he's got coming up next week. Hey, dude. Hey, man. What's up? Not much. How are you doing? I'm good. Hey, want to find out uh, who you've got coming up next week? 
Yeah, next week uh, is a drummer and percussionist named Lauren Costi. Uh, she and I met uh, a few times during my time in L.A. Uh, on We did a bunch of shows together, like I was playing drum set and she was playing percussion. Um, so uh, her, her L.A. resume is, is a mile long, um, but for the last year and a half, she's been in London. Um, she relocated there uh, not long ago, and since she's been in London, she's been doing this cool hybrid gig of like drum set and percussion uh, with uh, Russell Watson, who is uh, a vocalist, kind of a crossover, like opera pop uh, vocalist who's, who's touring around England and Europe. Um, so it was a really cool conversation with her about, uh, you know, the classical world versus the pop world and, and L.A. versus London uh, and, um, you know, the, the path that she's taken and the, the big turn that it's taken recently. Wow, that sounds great, man. Yeah. Thanks for the update, and I'll, uh, I'll give you a call All right. later. Thanks, man. Cool, Bye, man. Be well. Well, there you go, everybody. Uh, appreciate you listening, and uh, appreciate everyone's support and feedback and comments. Keep those things coming. And I hope to see you around. Thanks. Bye-bye.